Welcome, everyone. Uh, hello. Um, this I'm Bob Mover, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, our podcast, my podcast, called On the Real Side. And uh, we have always very interesting musicians and uh, guests. Uh, and I'm very happy to have today with us a young man, well, he's, he's not a young man anymore, I guess, middle-aged man, approaching middle age, uh, that um, I've known since he was uh, 10 years old, I believe. You were 10 years old when I met you. Wow. We can figure that out. And uh, we'll talk about how we met, and it's all quite interesting. But anyway, he's had quite a, an illustrious career in, uh, in music, on, uh, in many aspects of music, uh, from being a terrific drummer, uh, someone who can play with intensity without playing too loud, which you can count them probably on the fingers of maybe being lenient two two hands. But um, anyway, Mr. George Schuler. And uh, besides being a wonderful drummer, he's also a composer and arranger and recording artist and a producer of, of records. Uh, recordings, as we say now, because we don't know if they're records or CDs or, or streaming, which we'll discuss a little bit later, because uh, the time we're living in is pretty confusing that way. How do you put the music out? Anyway, we'll get to that. And also uh, a filmmaker. He's made two marvelous films, really, uh, really nice films that uh, are hopefully going to get released by someone. We'll discuss that a little bit. The the trials and uh, of, of what goes into making a film, uh, especially a jazz film. Sure. And, uh, you know, and, and also an archivist. Um, George has been and is right currently involved with the Lee Konitz archives, but has also done some archiving with uh, Herb Pomeroy and uh, some, uh, and radio shows that uh, have been, uh, like for instance, things that were done in Boston, some recordings from the Village Gate in New York of various things. So he has, uh, but primarily it's uh, been the, the Konitz archives that have been keeping you busy right, lately, right, George? Yeah, there's a few other uh, archives and collections that I've gotten my hands into and uh... Uh, the Rashid Ali collection was uh, something else okay. that I was working on with uh, two other great uh, uh, archivists and um, uh, Ben Young and Joe Lizzie. And, um, and yeah, that's there's, been eye opening. There, there was also another one I had down here that, uh, oh, the George Avakian. Right. Yeah. And that, on. Yeah. That was, that's because. Uh, I was actually looking for a specific uh, Eric Dolphy recording that was listed there, um, and um, I, I, you know, this was an obscure recording that was done at Town Hall in 1962, and I had previously known about this recording um, because I had uh, access to the John Lewis archive at one time, which was really the MJQ offices in Midtown. Uh, you know, the connection with my with my dad, Gunther Schuler and John Lewis was was pretty uh, prominent. And um, at the time, Mariana Lewis, the, the widow of John Lewis, was was, uh, you know, allowing me to come up there and, and peruse the, the, the reels, the tape reels up there. And I said, oh, let me check this out. This uh, this seems to be fairly interesting. And it's a Dolphy at Town Hall. And I was going, well, what's that, you know? And uh, among other things that were of interest, of course, that involved my dad. But um, b beyond that, then, you know, the story gets weird because, you know, I, I found out that this was a very, very obscure recording of Eric Dolphy with his quintet performing at Town Hall with uh, Ed Armour and um, J.C. Moses and Richard Davis and Herbie Hancock. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to go down there a little, you know, detailed rabbit hole here, but I, this will flesh out the, the story if I tell it this way. Um, 
And, and so, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, who knows about this? And, you know, I started to ask a few people um, and I made a copy of it because uh, I said, you know, I can't let this go. I mean, this is unbelievable. So it's, it's like the full concert and it was shared with a poet named Ray Dragonette. And um, so she, she did her poems. Uh, in between, female, Ari. Sorry? A, a female poet. Yes, a female, Ray, yes, Ray, R-E-A. Uh, R-E-A. Yeah, yeah. And, and she was kind of obscure herself, although a little bit known in the, in the uh, poet world of that time, in the early 60s. And she, there were a couple of books that came out of her, uh, of her poems. And the uh, band and, accompany her poem, did she like read and the band played or was it? Uh, well, actually, the, the, uh, Eric's band played first and then she came on and did about 20 minutes. And then Eric's band came back on and then she did another 20, 30 minutes. And then finally, there was one more set. Um, what but it was wasn't the, like the Kenneth Rexroth. Um, no. Ken Nordine, those type of uh, no, no, it wasn't you know jazz and poetry together, you know, with a blues or the Lenny cliche Bruce blues in the background, you know. As Lenny Bruce used to say, next week, jazz and poetry with Leibowitz and the Scottsboro Boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was this was a little bit drier, and you know, her reading of her poems, uh, not the greatest, a little bit on the you know sort of drab side, um, but what's interesting here is that Dolphy uh, wrote uh, these new tunes based on her poems and and one of them turned into Hat and Beard which we all know was you know on that uh, Blue Note recording Out to Lunch that Eric did a couple right. of years later but he had titled it differently He'd, it was a different title according to the program that, that came out on this uh, concert and uh, it is the first performance of Hat and Beard. And, you know, among other first uh, performances of, of some other uh, other tunes that he wrote for that particular instrumentation, that quintet. And, um, you know, here's this concert that was recorded. And, and so, you know, I had to give the tapes back to uh, uh, Sasha Lewis, the son, um, you know, and um, they were going through an inventory and cataloging and, uh, you know, I said, that's fine, you know, but, uh, you know, I, meanwhile, I had to keep a copy of it. So, but, the, but, but there was one side of one of those reels that was a little bit, you know, the, the tape had been wobbling through the head. So I felt like, oh boy, you know, if we ever find a way to put this out or whatever, you know, um, it should be, you know, a cleaner possibility then i find out well avakian also had a copy of this and and so I, that's why i volunteered at the new york public library to look through that but then i realized oh my gosh yeah george was this amazing uh you know uh, entrepreneur of everything in jazz the, the the legacies that he left the first albums that he made and then every, all the associations he had with starting with louis armstrong uh, then, you know, uh, Sonny Rollins, Paul Desmond, uh, Charles right. Lloyd, Keith Jarrett. Tell people that George was, I knew him a little bit too, uh, not well, but he was the head of A&R right. at, at Columbia Records. Right. And was responsible for, you know, the Sonny Rollins records that he made shortly after that retirement, his, what they call the bridge retirement, and the record being the bridge. He also, like, like, um, Ed, Ed, his brother is Ed. George just mentioned, um, you know, was responsible for a whole lot of music that came out. And just to add one more thing, he lived until and was pretty active up until the age of, I think it was 96. Yes, or, yes. You know, yeah. And at least yeah. until 94, you know, he was still uh, involved in the music. So, well, yeah. This was fairly undocumented, but you know Matt Snyder was the one who really curated the Avakian collection at the New York Public Library, and he gave me the green light to actually delve into a lot of the, you know, the reels that weren't marked, and there were at least uh, I would say maybe fifty to seventy uh, unlisted or un un um, unmarked reels where I thought I could find the other half of that uh, Eric Dolphy Town Hall concert. I only found half of that. 
you know, on one reel and there was indications there was another reel, but it might've been recorded over, who knows? In any case, now I get swept into the Avakian, you know, oeuvre and it's, uh, you know, unbelievable. And, you know, I'm still going through it, even though Matt Snyder has done a further, you know, research and, and uh, annotation of that collection, which is now available to the public. And so, you know, diving into Sonny Rollins, for instance, of things that had not been released when he was just coming out of retirement in 1961. Oh, man, what a period that was. Oh, my gosh. And these are the gallery. live recordings at the Jazz Gallery. Exactly. With that Jim Hall. Band, by the way. Jim, go, go ahead. Jim Hall, uh, uh, um, uh, Bob Cranshaw. And, and Ben Riley. And no, Walter Perkins. Walter and, Perkins. Oh. Yes. And there's three you know, beautifully recorded, maybe, you know, a little bit under beautiful, but still, I mean, you know, you can hear all the excitement. It's well done. And it was probably Avakian's idea to, uh, well, actually it was Atlantic Records idea to record Rollins before he was signed to the next label because he was in between labels. And right, so Avakian actually got him a deal with RCA that right. everybody was talking about for years because it was the most money. It was the largest contract, including Miles, that up to that time, I'm told, had ever been given to a to a jazz artist. Yes, and, and Adam Levy, you know, in his wonderful book, his biography of Sonny Rollins talks about that. Um, what's, what's, but it, what's interesting is that there's this period where Rollins is not signed to anybody. Here's Atlantic Records actually recording them at Jazz Gallery, and then Avakian, comes up with the big money to to you know sweep them away from Atlantic Records and, and that's and interesting Nessui, because Nessui Atlantic Erdogan. is not a label that uh, Sonny had recorded for previously you know if it were you know other labels but he never did record for Atlantic so they were all set to get him right well and, he did not not officially but he did record with the modern jazz quartet on Atlantic Records so uh, uh yeah that was the you know the famous one uh uh, Sonny Rollins at Music Inn with the Modern Jazz Quartet. You know? And that was Atlantic. I see, but that was, that was, I, I always thought that was the, that was John Lewis's record with Sonny as a featured guest, but, you know, I. Yeah, it was the Modern Jazz Quartet with Sonny as a guest, you know, not, not, so that's why he had recorded somewhat on Atlantic in, in terms of as a guest. But uh, yeah, so he's signed to RCA and there, you know, there, there's more of this, you know, that, that intrigue of Sonny Rollins recording with Herbie Hancock and, and Ron um, McCourty. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm Roy McCurdy. Roy McCurdy. Ron, Ron McCurdy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Roy, Roy. Roy McCurdy. Yes. Roy McCurdy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, there's that thing that came out that now's the time Sonny Rollins plays jazz standards. Right. That came out that had some of those tracks and some, some of them. And then there was something that got released as uh, there was the standard Sonny Rollins, which was a funny, one because it seemed to be outtakes, a lot of outtakes from from maybe re, you know rejected tracks, and uh, it was explained to me, but not by Sonny. I can say, I never really Sonny and I have been friends for a long time, and I never really got into his business. You know, I, I, sometimes I talk about it with Lucille. You know, she would she would mention something um, wow. business wise, but um, she said Lucille told me once she said, you know, Sonny hates the intrigue of business. <laughs> she said, I, speaking as her, she said, I, on the other hand, I love the intrigue. <laughs> I love the the dealing with the business and the wondering and trying to make a better deal and this type of thing. She said, but Sonny couldn't get in that for five minutes. He, he just, but anyway, that was, um, you know, so then there was a thing that came out also called the alternative Sonny Rollins, which was also a whole bunch of stuff where Sonny was really experimenting. I think you can hear him. Uh, kind of under the influence of of Ornette in some ways, and definitely wanting to move forward because I think Coltrane had been kind of had been going in a certain direction where he was getting you know further on the edge of the avant-garde and right into the avant-garde, and then Sonny didn't want to feel I think didn't want to be left behind. You know I think he wanted to try. Also, he had a very exploratory nature himself. Oh, of course, so it was not entirely like he just wanted to keep up with keeping up with the coal trains, you know, but um, any, anyway, that was um, uh, a period, but uh, 
which is a kind of an interesting period for Sonny. What I mean is that there, there are some things that really make it, and other times you hear him really fishing for something that he's searching for. And the search is quite interesting, you know. He was in very itself. restless, very restless. And, you know, you're, you can imagine George as the producer of these recordings, kind of like letting Sonny do what he does. But then, you know, you're, we're talking about LPs. So each track couldn't be, you know, the, the kind of lengthy way that Sonny would approach it, you know, 20 minutes on a certain tune. Um, that's what you get at the Jazz Gallery, by the way, these long, you know, 15 minute, 20 minute versions of Will You Still Be Mine? And, um, you know, beautifully, I mean, you know, first of all, I just want to say that Jim Hall, this is something that guitar players should hear because I don't think Jim had that kind of competition uh, of a soloist like that, um, either before or after. And and the two of them are like titans. And and the way Jim is, you know, sort of accompanying Sonny Rollins, uh, it's just yeah. remarkable. And you wonder why Sonny had either blocked the, the release of this or maybe it had some contractual reason because of Atlantic having recorded it first. I don't know. But it I seems would like... say that it goes with the no blows. In other words, a friend of mine goes with the people that don't play and not everyone who doesn't play is a no-blow. But, you know, there are people who who you realize if they did play something, they'd probably sound very good. Yeah. You know, they don't like, you know, somebody like Dan Morgan Stern or Ira Gittler or even though Ira owned a saxophone, you know, he doesn't didn't really try to do that. And there are other people. And then there are Nat Hentoff, I think, Barry Ulanov, those people were really serious about uh, and had good taste. But I think the people that control the deals and that kind of thing in the music business are often the type of people that uh, my friend used to, Tony Castellano used to refer to as the, uh, I've said this before, the no blowing motherfuckers shortened to the no blow mofos <laughs> than just to the no blows. And he would say, it's a no blow world out there, Bobby. <laughs> and uh, the music business world is controlled by these no blows. And society in general, I mean, if you want to think of the greatest no blow, the biggest no blow, I can't use the word great with him in the same sentence, but let's say if you want a picture of a no blow, there's Donald Trump. So yeah. He's the ultimate, yeah. ultimate no blow. Well, we but, got more names for him than. And you know. yeah, there's other ways. That's, that's yeah. one of the kinder things we could say. Right. But I know what, you, what, I, what I mean to say is that a lot of the time, this music that never got out gets lost in the shuffle because of these people that don't really care the way George Abakian cared about the music, you know? Well, that's my, my point is that, you know, Sonny was really the one that blocked this um, for some reason. And, and I bet, I think George made an effort to try to release these uh, later on because he had all sorts of unissued RCA stuff that he uh, tried to, you know, get permission, you know, through various channels um, that uh, didn't quite work out, although, some of it leaked and Japan got some, you know, um, some of those tracks and put those out uh, surreptitiously, who knows. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, what this was a, a moment right out of retirement. And, uh, and, and so that's why I feel like it's a very important recording. I think, I don't know, there's been some uh, movement in the background of uh, certain uh, a, a certain label I, I won't mention that might, uh, you know, try to pursue this. I wonder if, uh, you know, Zev Feldman is out there also, you know, checking this out because, uh, you know, everybody has access to these recordings if they wanted to go to the New York Public Library. Um, I mean, you can listen there, but you can't really walk, walk away with them, you know. <laughs> no, no so, I wouldn't think so, yeah. but that's interesting yeah. that any of us could go in and, and just look up you that can yeah, yeah i mean that's the that's the, the i don't you know that's the concept there you can you, they set you up with a little computer and you have to sort of hook it up with headphones and you know it's that kind of uh uh protectionist type of uh system um but but uh yeah you can check all that stuff out i mean look you know it's not just sonny rollins also the charles lloyd uh period is very interesting uh, whether you you know you kind of dig what he was doing early on or later Sam on. Sam Jarrett and Ron McClure. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, and then soon enough it's Keith Jarrett and. Uh, uh, but there is this period right before that, before Keith joins, 
and and uh, D. Jeanette and uh, Cecil McBee, where Sonny, where Charles is still kind of playing around. You know, he he, he had his his partner was Gabor Zabo, who was this guitar player, and I'm they made a, made a recording with Ron Carter and Tony Williams, which is a beautiful this Columbia recording. Uh, I'm forgetting the title at the moment, but then you know those Ron and Tony are with Miles and they get busy. So Charles hires Charlie Charlie Hayden and Lewis Hayes in the rhythm section, and right, there's this that. TV bro broadcast of Charles Lloyd, Gabor Zabo, Charlie Hayden, and Lewis Hayes that was done um, to promote the next Charles Lloyd Columbia record that didn't use Charlie and, and Lewis Hayes. So there they are live in this little studio and there's Avakian interviewing them. This apparently was, I don't know if it was even aired, um, but it's it exists. There's this video, 30 minutes worth. That's beautiful. Um, just to see Charlie, you know, in there playing in this kind of standard way, you know, with Lewis Hayes, beautiful, man. And Gabor Zabo, kind of a, an un, underrated, uh, you know, experimentalist kind of guitarist at that time with that kind of brittle sound that he had. A beautiful brittle sound, I should say. Yeah, um, yeah. so anyway, that's that's what I've been, you know, immersed in with uh, the Avakian uh, um, part of my life. Well, you know, I know that also, you know, you've worked with your father, your dad, among other things, that he also was uh, a person of many trades being, you know, a composer, um, a conductor, um, you know, a, a jazz French, well, a French horn player in both classical and a member of the original Birth of the Cool, Gunther Schuller, a president of, of, of New England Conservatory. And uh, one of the, the books that he authored, uh, a book called Early Jazz, which was very complete and thorough uh, in the mentioning of just everyone that contributed to early jazz. And I guess he planned it as a kind of trilogy uh, of books. And uh, George worked uh, on that second book with him, which is called, um, is it? The Middle Swing Era. The Swing Era, right. Yeah. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of a plain, plain uh, title, but it, it gets to the point, I suppose. And, and Gunther, who would have turned um, 96 years old uh, this week, I think his birthday was the 22nd of November. Actually, he he, he was going to turn 98 tomorrow. 90, 90, I mean, uh, uh, November 22nd, uh, Wednesday. Right. 98, so, yeah. 98, yes. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to uh, do the third volume, which would have been Bebop and Beyond. And maybe there would be four. But, you know, Bebop could cover a whole thing. I mean, which I, we don't even like the term Bebop, but, you know, modern jazz, let's say from you know, from 1940, you know, 41, 42 through right. 1959, and then probably another era of jazz begins then. I don't know. I can't archive it myself. But, you know, I think that, do you have any desire to continue on along those? Just, or I think you've got a lot to do without that. <laughs> but, I tell you that, you know, it's interesting to even uh, hypothesize what he was planning to do i think ultimately what what uh, prevented him from doing that was um that he you know the first thing he wanted to do with the priorities were uh writing music and and he was getting commissioned a lot by all sorts of uh orchestras and institutions and and organizations and musicians and um he also wanted to write a conducting book that was very important to him. Uh, the Complete Conductors is uh, one another book that he wrote, and then also his autobiography, uh, which you know started in uh, I think the early two thousands, and um, he uh, completed it uh, by twenty thirteen or twenty twenty. Uh, might have come out earlier than twenty eleven, let's say, and. You know, he was planning to do a second volume to his autobiography because he only got up to 1960. Um, you know, so there was this whole, you know, another 50 years to. to yeah, he was just approaching middle age in 1960. Yeah, I know. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's and that that book ended up being about um, the first draft was about 800 pages. Uh, it was a real struggle at that time. Books, you know, weren't 
I don't know the the uh, his first uh, publisher um, uh, in in London. Um, uh, my memory of that uh, the name of that publisher. Anyway, they were they did all the other books. They didn't want to do memoirs anymore, um, and so he had to he had to look for another publisher, and that was a big struggle. Finally, he came up with the University of Rochester. And they had to cut it down from 800 pages to about 650. <laughs> Still, you know, this it's a huge book, no. and it's oh, a God. lot of lot of intrigue, you know, of his life is is as a kid and all these things that he was doing um, in the classical world, and then discovering jazz and being, and and you know, this great story of how he uh, met up with John Lewis, um, you know, in 1948 at the end uh, in the winter of 48. And uh, that was the gateway to uh, all the jazz uh, things that he was doing uh, right after that, uh, including being part of the Birth of the Cool recording sessions. Yeah, there's um, a legendary story about Gunther, which I don't know if it's true, and I never really asked Sonny about it either. But I'm sure you, you know of it, that I think he wrote an article called Sonny Rollins and the Challenge of Thematic Improvisation. Yes, yes, I'm that, aware. Was, that was not Martin Williams. That was Gunther who wrote that article, right? Right. And the the old, the, the legendary story, which is legends, you know, our legends, you got to see. Sometimes they need to be taken with several tons of salt. But um, somebody said, I think Sonny was at a party, and he said, oh, by the way, Gunther Schuller is here. And, you know, and he loved to talk to you. They had never met, but Gunther had written this article. And so he said, I want to meet him. You know, I, I don't want to talk to him. He said, he's... They said, well, what is it? He said, well, I read that article he wrote about thematic improvisation, and it really screwed me up. I've been trying to do that. And I think I'm losing something by having read that. I think it affected me the wrong way. You know, and I've been... Now, he may have been just putting him on, you know, but I don't know because I wasn't there. But that's a funny story. Yeah. But, you know, you, George, getting down to you a little bit, yeah. um, you know, having come up from... Uh, in the family with, that you came up in. I want to talk a little bit about how I ran into you. Um, you know, George is what a person you might call, um, Conus used that expression about somebody once. He said the guy was well listened as opposed to well read. You know, he said, yes, he's well listened. And, uh, you know, your, your basement, I, well, I, okay. I started to play when I was, uh, 18, 19 years old, I lived at New England Conservatory. I had met Jackie Byard in New York, and Jackie took a liking to me, and uh, I played a lot with him. I mean, he was playing solo piano with the Village Gate, sometimes like four or five nights a week, and I would come up and sit in with him, play duets with him. Um, That's great. Wow. Frequently, and then he brought me to Harvard University to play a concert with him, he, I sat in on two or three tunes. He played the concert solo trio, and then he brought me up, and he had Buell Neidlinger on bass and Alan Dawson on drums. Wow. And so, you know, he brought me up to New England, uh, to, to Har Harvard from New York to play this concert with him. And then my dad lived in Boston, but he lived in Sharon, Massachusetts, which is about 15, 20 miles south of Boston. And he came in to go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then he went home at 5. And I and plus he was no, newly married to my stepmother, and I didn't want to be a third wheel over there. And fortunately, I had a friend named David Reskin, a flutist. And David and I had gone to high school in Florida together, and he had a roommate named Gordon, who was never there. He was a blind guy, and he was on the road with a show band, and he only came in for exams. So there was an extra bed in David's room. So basically, I moved into the conservatory and lived there. And Jackie invited me to come to any of the, his classes and called me his teaching assistant. You know, Jackie needed a teaching assistant like I needed a leak in my saxophone. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but there I was. And I, so I spent also living in Jordan Hall, the, in the, the dorms there, there were pianos in the basement. Any hour of the day or night, you could, you could go there. So, you know, I had several things. Um, I, I, I played in the combat zone, uh, what was it, the four, three o'clock lounge, I forget what it was called, but with Bobby Ward on drums 
and Bobby Nellum's on organ. And I would play these strip shows and then come back after the strip shows at about two in the morning and go to the basement of Jordan Hall and practice until the sun came up, then catch a few hours of sleep. Meanwhile, I even was eating meals in the cafeteria. They thought I went there. I said I couldn't find my ID card. And, uh, and I was also auditing. I got to know a lot of the teachers. And so I audited classes like uh, Robert DiDomenico let me take his Schoenberg class and Ernst Oster, I studied Schenkerian analysis because I was fascinated with that. And then I started to apply that to bird solos and uh, bird and bud and, you know, Holman Hawkins and stuff. So I, I did that and I basically went there. And some of the kids were complaining about me not being, some of the kids found out I was a paying, not a paying student. And why should I have all the privilege and blah, 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 and this and that. But in the meantime, there was a little band that we had with your brother, Ed, who was about two or three years younger than I am. Um, I'm born in 52 and he's born in 55, I think. Or 50. Right, January 55, yeah. Right, and uh, uh, David Stewart on piano and Ricky Ford and me. And sometimes we had a drummer. The guy we used was Anton Fig, who was a South African cat who was on the, was it Letterman? He became the drummer on one of those late night shows. Yeah, uh, Antoine, the, yeah Antoine, exactly. Antoine Fig. Yeah, but we were often just a quartet, just, and sometimes just a trio, Ed and David Stewart and I, and we'd play all night. We had that church David Stewart had, and Ed and I, we'd all go to the church. But many weekends, your, your brother was sort of a student of mine. He also was dating my sister for, for about a year or so. And uh, they were they were very cute together. They were kind of, you know, in love <laughs> with that teenage young, young love. Yes. But I would come over to your house and uh, Ed was kind of studying with me because I was a little more advanced than what I knew. And uh, I would show him stuff. And he and I, he had some of Scott LaFaro's notebooks. I remembered we went through uh, that. And then there was the basement, the record collection. So in my, in my father's house, in your father's house, this was your father's house. This was the family house in Newton. Right. Right. And, um, people laughed years later when I said, Oh, I got to know Gunther pretty well. Actually, there were two incidents that were interesting. Um, one, one thing was that, uh, um, I, I had asked Ed if he could straighten out these the people were complaining about me living in the conservatory. And maybe if I talked to Gunther, who was the president of the school, we would have a, you know, I, 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 at least he'd know what's going on. And, and so you, you, he knew, oh, yeah, that's right. He had picked me up at the, the train station. You couldn't walk to your house from the train station. You needed to get a ride. And uh, so Gunther would actually pick me up and we'd talk music. And uh, he, he liked the fact that I knew his variations on crisscross and had checked out some of Orchestra USA you know, because I, I was voracious like you, listening to everything I could. And, uh, you know, we had a really nice, uh, we'd have nice conversations about music and, and life. It took about 10, 10 to 15 minutes to get from your house to the train station. And, you know, people said, you mean Gunther Schuller used to pick you up at the train station and bring you? I said, yeah, he knew I was coming to play with Ed and, I, and Ed was learning some stuff. And so, you know, he, he found it very worthwhile to pick me up. And, and he was a really nice guy, you know, and I got to know him at different stages in life, we have conversations every few years and, yeah. you know, but, but, but um, the, the, the beef of the story is finally, I went to his office one day and, uh, you know, we actually arranged a meeting. Uh, Ed, Ed said, I said, can I talk to you? That's because some people were complaining. Jackie Byer said some people didn't want me to come to his class because, you know, so I met in, in Gunther's office and he said, so I understand you're, you're living in the school, you're living in the dorm and, I said, I explained the situation. My friend's roommate is never there and I can practice all night. And, you know, I'm, that's what I'm doing. And, uh, and, and your father said something to the extent of like, well, you know, I didn't hear anything about that. I, I think um, we, we never really had this meeting. I'm, you know, and, uh, you know, anybody asked me, I don't know. It's uh, up to them. You know, let's see. But, you know, it's not my concern. I'm busy running a school. You know, what do I need to do? So he was cool. He was a nice cat. Yeah, it seemed to be a, a little bit loose. I think uh, Dave Stewart was sort of in the same position, right? You know, like, right. I don't know if he was an official student at NEC 
um, or, you know, he may have taken, you know, sort of glummed himself onto certain classes um, like you did. And uh, but he had a place to stay at night. I guess you were. <laughs> where were you sleeping? I mean, what, what in was David's that? room, in David Reskin's room. Oh, David Reskin's room, right? And in the dorm, or in, in the a... dorm, right in the yeah, dorm, yeah. right? And and uh, you know, it was like wonderful because I had quit high school, and I never had a college experience. Like also the fun of staying up late at night with Mark Belair, drummer who ah. uh, did a lot in New York later, and and Mark was also very literary. Both of us would read. Another guy named Don Tarshis, who died uh, just a couple of years ago, beautiful guy, uh, was very much into uh, avant-garde composition and that kind of thing. He studied with Di Dominica, Robert Di Dominica. And um, my grandmother offered me money for, uh, for, comp for lessons. So um, Joe Maneri, Joseph Maneri, yes. wonderful, wonderful teacher and, you know, also an incredible composer. I studied the, the Schoenberg Harmony book. Not the not the twelve tone, but the you know, Harmonisch Stuck. Yeah. Uh, the blue the, the Schoenberg blue book. We went through that. And uh, you know, so I was I was sort of a student, but I just and uh I would find teachers that interested me and say, Can I audit your class? So I just it was a perfect educational situation. I only went to classes I wanted to. And they, you know, everybody was cool, you know. It's funny that you mentioned both David Reskin and also Mark Belair because they were one of the originals, original uh, members of the New England Conservatory Ragtime Ensemble. I, I remember that they had that. They went. They actually played gigs. Under yeah. The well, it all be, became a real big thing, you know. And and the, you know, of course, the Redback Book, the recording they made for Angel uh, Records, uh, won the Grammy. And, ah, uh, and that's, I, I that really that. launched them, yeah. And um, so that's that's really great because uh, you know I've been in touch with uh, David of, of uh, you know over the time, and we've interviewed him. Also, Mark is has uh, been in touch with us. Um, yeah, but, I'm still kind of in touch with Mark, who's become yeah, a very yeah. good poet as well. <laughs> right, right, yes. And uh, his son is actually one of the head writers on Jimmy Fallon's show. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, it's been a while. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's a sweet cat. And David, I kind of lost in touch with, but I stay in touch with Charles, his brother, sometimes. Right. And, right. You know, David went out to Hollywood and had another kind of career, but uh, in out of kind of outside of music. Cause... Well, he came back for the, you know, the Ragtime Reunion weekend that we did at oh. New England Conservatory in, in um, the fall of 2018. And so that's when I got a chance to, you know, uh, put him, sit, sit him down and, and film him, interviewing him about his time with the Ragtime Ensemble. Oh, um, so, uh, you know, that was an opportunity that I needed to, by the way, you know, I do have, and this is something else that I'm going to have to send you. I do have a recording of you and Dave, Dave Stewart and my brother and Ricky Ford. Uh, I think this is a cassette that David had and he allowed me to transfer it for him. So. Um, you know, this is some of your earliest recordings, maybe. It, it um, may be the very earliest recording um, uh, of me, I think, you know. Yeah. Where, and, yeah uh, so, but also, I wanted to add one other person that might have been floating around with you. He was actually a, a student at the conservatory, and he became sort of a mentor to my brother as well. And that's Boots Mallison. Boots was, Mallison, of course. Yes. So, yeah, when, know, when Boots was playing cello. Right. And, you know, sometimes we'd have your brother on bass and Boots would play some cello with us. And he was just starting to play the bass. I mean, as opposed to, you know, he had been playing cello for quite a while. It was very good. But yeah, Boots was wonderful. And I mean, I saw him a few years ago, but, um, you know, I, uh, in fact, one time I did see Boots in Amsterdam once, uh, many, when I was with Chet Baker, he was with Ron Carter's band, right? Playing bass, and Ron was playing cello. Oh, not cello. Ray, but Ron was playing the uh, the piccolo little bass. bass. Piccolo, piccolo bass. bass. That's yeah. right. The piccolo bass. And I remember he was looking bewildered. The airline had lost his clothing, so he had one one outfit that he had to wear until they found his suitcase. And he'd been in them for about three days because it was the weekend, and he didn't have time to go to a store. So he was, you know. 
but yeah, Boots is an exceptionally beautiful cat, you know. Right. The other and thing that you, another thing that you and I share from our youths, though uh, a bit apart, is uh, you had a show on um, W E. Uh, what was the the, uh, the show? MIT radio station. It was WTBS at first. Right. WTBS is when I had it. Right. Um, and what, it, what and then they, they changed the call letters to WMBR. Okay, I that's why we were listening yeah. to your interview. You said WMBR. I said, no, I don't remember it as that, but WTBS. There was a show called Jazz Celebration on Saturday mornings. Huh. Um, Saturday, I think it started at 11 o'clock or noon or something like that. It wasn't too early. And a fellow named Justin Freed had that show. Right. And at that time, Justin and I were very close friends. And Justin ran the, uh, he started out at the Orson Welles Cinema, but then he got his own theaters, uh, the Coolidge Corner Cinema, and uh, what's the, down the street from Coolidge Corner, Cleveland Circle, no, Coolidge Corner. It yeah. was a Coolidge Corner. Anyway, he got very busy with that. And he asked, I, I started doing it with him. So the two of us would play records and, and talk about music and these kind of things. And then he gave the show to me. He said he didn't have time. So I would go in on Saturday and I did this for the better part of a year, you know, around uh, the year after I stopped living in the conservatory, I got an apartment on Beacon Hill. And, but I did this every Saturday morning. I went and I would play records and, you know, you're very brash at that age too. You know, like I would, I had the audacity that's with Konitz or Rollins. I mean, I would play the record the way it went. And then I'd have my horn and I'd say, and now I'd like to try to play a duet with. <laughs> you so you're, you're doing this on air, right? Is that what on you're air. Saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, Fantastic. uh, I, you know, I, uh, you know, when Mingus came to town, I was sitting in with Mingus. That's how I met him. But, um, I brought Bobby Jones who had introduced me to Mingus and he came in and I did a little show with him and interviews. Sometimes I knew somebody at the workshop, but then in listening to your interview, we were probably around the same age. I was about 19 and I had this, uh, you know, this radio show on the same station as you did. And I remember the record library there and, um, I never helped them acquire records the way you did, but, um, I can only say that I only stole one record in the whole year that I worked there. I mean, it was a free gig. First of all, you were not, we were not getting paid for this, uh, nor did I feel that it was necessary because it was a wonderful opportunity because you could borrow records from the library. I'd take them home and eat them up and then take them, take other records. So, you know, it was, it, it was a wonderful thing, but the only thing I had, because it was not on LP were the early Bud Powell on Verve with T for two and April in Paris. And, and those things, I, uh, I took that record and I meant to give it back. <laughs> you, know, I never you, that I, you know, when I start, well, by the way, I started working there. Uh, I had my regular show in the uh, uh, spring of 1977 and I was um, still a senior in high school. So, you know, I was 18 um and the, the guy who allowed me you know sort of gave me an introduction to that station was a buddy of mine who's an alto player who you probably know jay branford um, yeah I knew, yeah not real well but i knew he was yeah well jay uh, uh came from commonwealth high school and that's how i got to know him through a, a, another classmate of mine from grade school who ended up at commonwealth school so I was introduced to Jay that way, and I knew that he was a clarinet player. And then he uh, 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 graduated from Commonwealth High School and was at MIT. In And his uh, freshman year at MIT, uh, he started doing these radio shows uh, on the, the what was a, a sort of a jazz block. We, we had, I think, the 6 to 8 p.m. primetime slot from Monday through Friday. Oh, and um, already we had guys like Al Julian doing his Tuesday night show. I remember um, Al Julian was also an A and R man for Concord Records. Exactly. Yes, he was the East Coast A uh, and R guy, right. or at least the representative. Um, 
I don't know how involved he was with actual recordings, but he was yeah, sort of, you know, promoting whatever Concord put out. And that was a little he bit was involved later. enough to try to get me one and I didn't get it. But anyway, and, <laughs> and he was a huge Woody Herman fan. So, you know, he was, That's right. he was definitely like into all that kind of big band stuff. He, he, he had Charlie the Whale. Right. Charlie right. the Whale, which was Woody's uh, sort of. So, he, so, so the, the other guys, Jay had the Monday night show. I think it was called Bebop Spoken Here. Um, and then Wednesday nights was a, a, a woman named Christine Sweet who was moving to, I think, Chicago. And she was the one who sort of said, why don't you take over my show? So I took over Wednesday, the Wednesday slot, called it Impressions. Uh, and then a Thursday was, um, I uh, what, who was Thursday at the very beginning? Um, I think Richie Seidel was there. Oh yeah, um, I remember at the very beginning. Too. But there might have been somebody before him. And then it was Bo Leibowitz. I don't know if you remember Bo. I remember him very well. And I used to stay with him in California. Wow. When I would go to LA. Yeah. Actually, Bo Bo didn't have room in his pad. It was very small, the little place he lived. But I would stay with his ex-wife and her <laughs> current husband. They had a room there. And so Bo set me up. He was like really the only person I knew well in LA, except uh, some cats that were real busy in the studios. But Bo, where I'd come to town and he had that radio show one day a week in uh, LA, and he would always do a big Bob Mover feature on my birthday. Oh man, that's great. And, you know, he was a pianist, by the way. I didn't know that until uh, I saw his obituary because he passed away several years ago. Yeah, about and, five and years he, now. He was, uh, you know, I don't know if he was an amateur pianist or, you know, but. I never knew that when I knew him uh, on the radio show. Plus, he he had that used record store in Harvard Square called Bojo. Bojo. Yes, <laughs> Bojo, so, the Joe yeah, Passeretti. Oh, okay. Joe Joe Passeretti, I think was his name. Yes, Joe Passeretti was his. That was the Joe. Right, the partner. Bo, and that. then there was Joe. Right. And those guys, they they loved music, you know. And in those days, when I was playing my first gigs. Um, I was living in New York, you know, but I would come to Boston. But I met them at the same time when I had the radio show and was still living in Boston, uh, hanging out with Jackie Byard and doing, among many other people that were there. But um, yeah, and, and Joe died young too. Right, right, uh, yeah. But you know, the, so it's, it's kind of an interesting lineup, uh, you know, with Jay on Monday, Al on Tuesday, I was Wednesday, Richie Seidel, you became, you know, the A&R man, 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 records, yeah. right. And he got right, Joe right. Henderson out of, I don't know, you know, at least he signed Joe Henderson and uh, got him more prominence uh, yeah. in a way that he deserved. And he and had so, Mitch, Mitch was his brother, Mitch Seidel. Right. The yeah, photographer, I, I believe. Right? Yeah, I, they were, I knew them as, Yeah. those were the Bojo crowd, by the way. We would all sit there, Pete DeGroff, trombone player, a friend of mine. And Bojo, as you see, would let you listen to records before you bought them, like um, like the olden days. Right. You could actually, you know, they would play them. You'd hand Bo or Joe one of the records. You didn't handle it because then if something happened to it, they could be responsible for it. And you'd say, oh, man, you got this Lenny Tristano record. You know, I never heard the new Tristano. Wow. <laughs> they say, you want to hear it? And we put it on and listen to it. And yeah, here, let me give you a down payment. I'll pay you the rest of the next week, you know, whatever it was. They oh, were man, very... I I lived at those stores. I mean, we, you know, first of all, we had the Harvard Coop, which was a favorite store of mine um, because they had a very good, you know, jazz uh, uh, department. But but mostly it was like either at Bojo's or Cheapo's. Cheapo, um, yeah, that was... yeah. And there there was Zounds. Um, I, I forgot exactly where that was. <laughs> Maybe that was uh, around Berkeley. And then a li little bit later on, Stereo Jacks which uh, was uh, famously uh, was owned by Jack Walker, who also took over, um, I believe, those Fridays, those that Friday show from Bo Leibowitz. Um, right. Early See, on. I was already in New York at that point. Right, right. So I moved back know, to New York in 1972. So I really started uh, there, I guess, actually, I started there in 76, I think in my junior year. Let me, <laughs> wow. Now I'm I'm wondering about all this because you know MIT, they let you volunteer there. Um, you know it wasn't strictly for the students to use the radio shows there. 
Although there were yeah, some no, notes. I mean Justin Fried didn't have any affiliation with MIT. Exactly, he was a Harvard grad. Yeah, but, so but you know they grad. allowed me this little punk, uh, you know, jazz snob uh, from Noble and Greeno, you know, preppy school from Dedham, you know, and I, here I am. I'm doing these, you know, every Wednesday. By the way, you know, you, you sit. I had to, I had to really clean up that record library because it was a mess. Um, and that's how I became the jazz director because I decided to, you know, I, I think we had to order a lot of, of those reissues were coming out at that time, you know, Prestige, uh, whatever Blue Note was doing because there was no <laughs> Blue Notes left. Those were the prize, you know, maybe everybody lifted uh, one or two of Blue Notes out of that library. Impulse, forget about it. You know, no I, impulses. I returned mine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud to say, so, I, you know, ESP. I mean, maybe, record, I'm clean. Maybe there was a few obscure ESP records, but um, in any case, you know, I I, I spent many hours in that basement uh, uh, studio, and then, and you come out of there bleary eyed. And uh, I also did sometimes the overnight shift, you know, from two to six a.m. Um, and eventually. I got asked by Tony Chinamo to fill in for him on WBUR. So, um, and those were the overnight uh, programs, either that or I was like, you know, he had an evening show and then uh, eventually had a morning show. So I was kind of getting to, uh, you know, a little bit known as a radio DJ. It only lasted eight years because I got too busy as a musician. <laughs> But, Eight years is a while, man. Come on. But you know, it was a learning uh, curve. I mean, look. First of all, you, you're you're you've got this access to this library, and then I had my dad's record collection. I had my own record collection, and you put shows together, and it was a way of like figuring out what what works after you play Sunny, and then you play Ornette, or you go, you know, to the Kenny oh, Cox that, quintet, you know, from that, Detroit. That was so much fun, man. You know, I used to love doing yeah. that. And, you know, it really helped me as a band leader later when I started to, um, you know, program my own sets. You know, I would always hearken back in some ways to my days when I had the radio show and try to follow Paul Blaze's adage, which was funny about that. He said, when you're leading a band, he says, the main thing is don't let your fourth tune sound like your second tune. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know, I thought that was very wise. One time, you know what I did? I played. I realized they went really well together. I played the um, Birds version of Lester Leaps In, the very up tempo version of Lester Leaps In, which is actually recorded, and so it even sounds faster because it's uh, it was on one of those wire tape recorders that actually brought the pitch up a little bit and brought the speed up a little bit because as fast as Bird could play. You know, that was almost, you know, even even I would think beyond him. And I did check it out later. It was almost in the key of B. Wow. At least on the copy that we had. So I think it was from that Bird is Free record on Charlie Parker Records. But I followed it with the Gross of Fuga of Beethoven because it had the same kind of relentless energy. That, that's uh, great. Yeah. You know, so I would I could find creative ways. Like, that's what I, I think you have the same kind of thing. We're kind of we're creative people. So we'd find a creative way to kind of what they call now interactively participate in our well, own you, programming. Yeah, you're putting together a set of music and then, you know, eventually as a as a leader of a band uh, a few years later, you know, I had this mindset about how to put a set together of, you know, you start with whatever, a fast tune, then you, you slow it down with a ballad or you go to a three, four, or you, you know, you mix it up and, and you don't want to, you know, play the same kind of thing every yeah. time you so, know that's where that, yeah that was where, a good lesson and in i don't want to be one of those people lamenting the modern times and talking about the good old days but the fact that there was more live jazz being played everywhere around in in those days where you know like you would have today when i talk to some of the younger cats that are into the music they've gotten everything through records and the amount of it's not proportionate like people would say, well, you heard such and such and such and such. And I say, well, Rassan Roland Kirk, I knew some of his records, but I probably heard him live like 20 times. Right. And so I didn't learn. They say, oh, well, don't you do know this record? And I, I serenade to Kuku. I say, well, I know part of that record, but I remember him playing that tune, 
live yeah. and hearing it several times. You know what I mean? And and you would hear how they programmed their set. So you could go and one night you'd hear Rasan do it, another night you listen to Art Farmer, or another night it was Sonny Stitt. And you'd notice about that kind of thing, like the programming where, you know, of course, records were programmed too. And, uh, you know, that was, um, but I think the ability to, to hear somebody in the course of a week, did they keep their set the same? Was the fourth tune last night, now the second tune of this set? You know, it was, it was an interesting thing. Or did they play different tunes every night or did they tend to play one repertoire one week? And then when you heard them six months later, they were basically playing the same. They always had the same, well, they always had seven or 10 tunes that they were playing in the course of the night but they might have five new ones mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and play three or four of the, the ones they were playing six months before or none of the ones they were playing. So you heard uh, kind of the, the minds of, of great musicians, how they would program their music live. And uh, I think the cats now it's unfortunate they don't get a chance to, you know, cause also you used to be able to walk into a club and have one drink at the bar. And, you know, there was often no cover if you didn't take a table. And so you could you could go in two or three nights and hear somebody like I'd hear Bill Evans like sometimes four nights in a row if I wasn't working. I'd just go in and hear him and hear what he was thinking this week. And then, you know, he was always at the Vanguard and I lived ten minutes from there. Wow. So Ugh. you know, so that was like my twenties, I would have that. But you know, so I think that's uh, one of the things. The other thing that you mentioned in your interview that I thought was very good subject was okay you know we're making we used to make these cds we made lps and then you know i won't go back to 78s you know in my lifetime it was lps right and you know I, that was yours that was mine and then, too. then we had cds and then now no one actually uh, has cds um you know in fact my last cd that was released or the next to the last cd that was released i did for motema and it was a two record set and you know it had really good cats on it and and it's good it's, you know it's okay it's, I, I mean i don't know i can't judge my own music from that but anyway i got a letter and it reminded me of something kevin hayes told me a few years ago too um i, I got an email let me say and it said well we have 700 copies of your cd left about a couple of years ago we offered you them for two dollars each and uh you took uh 50 of them or something, you know, and, and then, you know, now we're going to offer you as many as you want for free. All you have to do is pay for the shipping. So I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll take 500, let you destroy 200. And I had some said to our friend, uh, producer Jesse Kaiser, because she's got a little more space. I, my, my house is a big, a big place. I have a big apartment, but all the closet space and everything's pretty well taken. So uh, you know, so it, it's like they, I said, well, what do they do, you know, if they, uh, with the ones that you don't buy or don't get, you know? And so Kevin Hayes told me years ago, he said that uh, Blue Note was, he, he had to get his bias CDs because they were saying they would melt them down to make other CDs from. And I said, wow, now we can tell people that's the three M's of recording mixing mastering and melting melting <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah and just imagine you know uh that that history kind of being blended in with the new whatever it's going to be the next cd if they make a cd i don't know you know well the good point that you made was now you know with people's attention span or for whatever reason um there's a lot of streaming going on so you know when you even when you turn into spotify i want to hear warren marsh play melancholy baby so i i i hear melancholy baby and right after that they've chosen another thing that i haven't chosen to listen to yeah that's along the same lines they'll say oh here's here's lee Konitz playing this or now ladies you know but you don't the beauty of making lps and cds which i thought you put very well in the interview that i listened to you speaking with um Sam, Sama, Samo, Samo, yeah, yeah, was the storytelling aspect you mentioned, right? You know that when you made a CD or an LP, you heard the 
the, you were, the continuity was like a musical story. Right. One thing led to another and, and that, uh, and, and, and that was this, but now you, you don't get to tell a story anymore. I mean, it's one tune to one tune. It's, it's very fractured. I mean, you know, anybody who's making a recording, you know, they're in that, in that uh, moment, you know, they've created this uh, series of tunes that are, you know, maybe they're they're connected, maybe they're not so connected, but it tells the overall feeling and 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 the moment of those compositions and that period that you're in as a as a you know creative musician musician, and you know the direction that you're going, and and so you know nobody gets a sense of that when they're listening one tune to another, um, and everything's very fractured, and uh, you don't get uh, any you know credits or liner notes um you know because sometimes we would end up writing our own liner notes to explain what we were doing yeah um, you know or it could be as dry as ecm records were but we didn't mind that because those were beautiful recordings anyway um because sometimes they didn't have any you know liner notes at all um but you know it's it's a different world i don't know i'm still trying to figure it out and uh, well i do the wikipedia yeah. method now if i want to know who was on a certain recording you know i do the streaming on the internet and yes. then i say who was the drummer on that record and right. i look it up and you know there it is you go to the artist you go to discography and you know you just have to do a little more of that a little more but, digging you go to discogs uh which is also a good resource right that's one for, that you get that yeah but and, uh, uh yeah. so it's it's a funny world now and uh you know and and from cds you know also because of the recording industry and the process of making recordings we went from from you know reel to reel tape to um to uh dats i think uh didn't that come after um you know, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, well, it was it was actually like beta. I thought cassettes, like but that. but yeah. cassettes were really well. The, yeah, the first thing you know. Yeah, cassettes. But I'm I'm saying you know you're in the studio. They're gonna first record you on two inch video, two inch tape, if you've got a big band or if it's one inch tape. Right, or, right. See you know, on on what they're yeah. actually recording. You. And and then the next thing that they were doing, we're recording you on on beta tapes. And uh, ADATS was part of that, you know, which looked like VHS tapes. Then you had DATS. Then you had, um, you know, the computer comes along and you were starting to record right into uh, uh, gigabytes, I guess, or Pro, Pro Tools or whatever. Mm -hmm.